it'll just take me a minute to unpack. Because this is, normally I'm in front of nobody and everybody's listening after the fact, which is great. But I have a couple of things I need to get out before we start. I have those. It's funny you mention that because that was a bad day for me when I had a change to the 175s, but I did. I have something else that I'm going to bring out as well that I'll wear during the show. A World Series ring. That's part of the show. All right, hold on. Sanitizer. All right. Here we go. Hello. Welcome to Nothing Personal. Good to see everyone. Thank you for being here. So this is brand new. This is the first time we've ever gone live, and we're lucky. I'm happy to be in Philadelphia, which is only the second time I've ever said that, and I will explain during the course of the show why that is. I'm going to bring out, or you're going to see Matthew Coca. I want to introduce him immediately. He's our producer, and we've been together. We are like a relationship. We just had a fight backstage. We've been here for a couple of hours, you do a sound check, you get ready to do a show. And we're not a band, we're not anything. They wanted to know if I should rearrange the furniture, if I wanted some food. I said, water would be great. You know, do you want drugs? What do you want? And I said, no, I'm good. Like, we're easy. So I'm spending the time with Coco. We're going through the rundown, because that's what we do. Oh, God, I got to show these people. Oh, my God, do I have a story. The first time I ever got this ring, I had a... Uh, was 2003, I just thought of the story. This is what Nothing Personal is, it's not even in the rundown, but this really happened. I was at a bris, and I kid you not, and uh, I was standing in the back and it was hot, I was schwitzing a little bit like now, and the ring did not have any uh, protections on it, and I, meaning it was too big. So I had the ring on and I was gesticulating as I'm wont to do, right as the moil was about to do what he was gonna do, and the ring flew off my finger and it landed to the right of the kid who was drunk on wine, you know, waiting to get his thing chopped and to the moyo who was about to do it. And so for the rest of my life, and that's been, that was 04, got the rings, so that may have been in 04, 05, so it's almost 20 years. I, I walk around and it's impacting me now at my advanced age, but I walk around with the ring on and I keep my finger closed like that because when I do this or this, I don't want it to fly. So that is a true story of what can happen with the World Series ring. Getting back to Philadelphia, I, I, my sister, who I wish were here, uh, I've got family members here, I think, who's, if you're not in my family, please applaud. If anyone is not, that's very nice, thank you. Shocking but true. I think there's a Larry here, is Larry here? Larry, thank you. We're going to talk about autism and autism awareness. The 175s. Thank you. So she went to University of Pennsylvania, and my best friend, Brett Parker, who I think is here as well, thank you very much, went to the University of Pennsylvania, and I was here during spring fling. That was a fun trip to Philadelphia. Then I came back as president of the Marlins. Not as much fun. The fans in Philadelphia, I must say, I love you guys. I'm happy to be here. When we did the deal to do this tour in city wineries, uh, six of them I'm gonna be doing this month. When Philly was first, I thought it was perfect. It's the perfect place for me to start because there's little to no chance that anyone who will come, and if they do come, they're not gonna be friendly toward me because of my relationship with the Phillies, having been the president of the Expos and the Marlins for as many years as I was. And I would go to games here, and none of you, that is not the right example, of course, but there are some Philly fans who are probably at Citizens Bank right now they're not perfect. So the only story I'll tell about that, which is every story I hear on Nothing Personal, if you've never watched the show, it's called Nothing Personal with David Sampson. It's 45 minutes to 50 minutes. Now it's 50 because we're on the DraftKings network. And it's just me talking for that amount of time, which is crazy. But that's what the show is. And I talk about sports and business and culture and entertainment and movies. And I don't have a script. I don't have a teleprompter. I have coca in my ear. That's it. So this is also new because coca's not in my ear when he talks, which means I've said something wrong or I can't think of something, or as is happening now, I swear to you, what was I talking about? Do you have any idea? 
Oh, the time I was with the Marlins. The fact that Philly fans, thank you. Normally that's Coca, wake up. God damn, we've been here a long time, but I need you. You're supposed, he always says, you get back to the subject. I was in an elevator with my son and we were at Citizens Bank Park and I was wearing uh, my credential backwards, which is a special thing you do when you're on the road. You have an MLB credential, but you wear it backwards. Very important because you don't want to be seen by anyone on the visiting, on the home side, because it's just nothing good about it. And I was in the elevator with a bunch of fans because in Philly, where you sit is around the press level. It's where the visiting GM box is, where I would watch games only in stadia where I did not want to sit amongst the fans. Philly is an example of that where I would not want to venture down as often as I would in other cities, as much as I love to sit down there. But in any case, I'm in the elevator, and our traveling secretary is in the elevator. You only know traveling secretary from Seinfeld, if you're all old enough to know or young enough. Interesting. We did a demographic study for nothing personal. Let's just say it's good. We're old. It's totally fine. I'm good with that. Sam, you're not old. You're young. That's huge. By the way, we're, 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 how old are you? You are 23, 22. Um, we're going to be interviewing later, interviewing you if you don't mind. We're showing that to DraftKings Network as a way to get our demographic number down. So we're going to show that you are a fan of nothing personal. Thank you so much. So we're in the elevator with our traveling secretary. The traveling secretary has the worst job in baseball. I want to give you some insight into what that job is. It's not at all what you think. Their job is to take care of every player and every executive and every little thing they want. Everything. That's what the traveling secretary does. Forget arranging planes, trains, and automobiles, which they do. Forget dealing with hotels and figuring out where the team is going to stay. That's what they do. Forget dealing with tickets. That's what they do. But any time a player wants anything, they call the traveling secretary. And it's a vault. One of the things that you know if you ever meet a traveling secretary during the course of your life, anything you tell him, her, or them, in the vault. Manny Colon is with me, second best traveling secretary in my career behind Bill Beck. And we're in the elevator and someone looks at Manny Colon and he's got his credential on and it says Marlins and someone in the elevator going to their suite or going to their seat, Marlins, huh? They've got the worst fucking president in the sport. The most random, ridiculous comment out of a fan. You're going to have to X that out for the show. By the way, we're releasing this. Do not feel as though you have to laugh. Don't feel you have to pay attention. You can eat. You can drink. Because, again, I'm already winning tonight because I do the show in front of nobody. So I don't need to pause because no one's reacting to anything. So I may not pause while you're reacting. And if you don't react, no problem. Don't feel like you need to. Okay, thank you. It's not ideal. Hold on one second. <laughs> Forget that one. That one's not going to work too well. So Manny Colon says to the guy in the elevator, he says, what's wrong with David Sampson? And my son is there who's not yet been bar mitzvahed. So he's not exactly sure what's going on, except he knows I'm his father. He knows I'm never around. He knows that he's in Philly, which is cool. And he knows that I've traded all of his favorite players. That's pretty much all he knows about what I do for a living. I could get to the story of my daughter, too. Can I tell you the worst story about being the team president is when you've got daughters who have friends who are boys who then want to go to games and you want to show off as a dad, and so you bring them into the clubhouse, you introduce them to players, you get them autographs, and you sit them in the front row, and then the next day they don't talk to your daughter anymore, and then your daughter comes home crying because the boys used her to do exactly what I did and I fell for it. That's a negative. I think it's way, I think it's that versus the divorce that caused the issue with my kids. Way, way bigger situation. I think it was the fact that I was team president. So anyway, so Manny Colon says, I don't, I don't really think that you should think that. Do you even know him? And the answer was, and I'll never forget this, I don't need to know him. And that was it. You know what I did, because I'm David Sampson. I said, hi, I'm David Sampson. <laughs> And to the credit of this individual, he didn't say a word after that. 
Not a word. And this wasn't even cyber courage or keyboard courage. This was elevator courage. And he just dried up, dried up. I don't know why people give opinions about things they don't really know. That's the job I had. This is actually me, the schwitzy, neurotic, OCD, germaphobe guy who loves to talk and got his start by being paid by his mother not to talk at the dinner table. That's me. That is no joke. The first money I ever, people always say, hey, what was your first job? Not to talk. People cannot believe that. It's totally true though. Can you imagine how crazy your mom and stepdad have to be to pay you not to talk at a meal? I was like, no problem, <laughs> happy to do it. And my rates kept going up as I got older, which was amazing, by the way. <laughs> True story. My mom thought I was a, a, a drug mule, a drug dealer once. I don't have, mom, I made so much money by not talking. Why would I deal drugs? I actually, uh, I made money. You thought I was dealing drugs when I went to Tufts University freshman year, I was not. I was actually raising money from people who have never donated to the Tufts Annual Fund, and I was doing it to get the money to go visit my girlfriend in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee, Wisconsin happens to be where the owner of City Winery is from. Mike Dorf deserves a thank you. I believe he may have come in for this. He and I did not know about each other other than by name, and then this tour got booked, and then Mike and I got connected. We went to the same summer camp in Eagle River, Wisconsin. What are the odds of that? And now he is an owner of multiple of these amazing venues with amazing people. Okay, are we ready? We're gonna do an episode now. Coco, hold on, I think that was number three intro. I think that was that, all right, we're gonna go back to number one. We're gonna actually do it. We spent six hours getting ready and I did nothing the way I said I would and you wonder why it's just a two-person operation. Though we just got a third person, Sarah's hiding in the dark back there, Sarah. Finally, there is no show like ours where there's only two or three people working. It was Coke and I for the first thousand episodes. And uh, so we've been doing this show since October of 2019. It's called Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Okay, ready? Here we go. Hold on one second. I feel slightly dirty, <laughs> it's weird but true. I can't even imagine, can you imagine there's, there's signatures on the wall back there and all I see instead of famous people are people who have touched this mic before I have. <laughs> that is literally all I see. And they have very weird blue lights in the bathroom. <laughs> it's the exact opposite color you want backstage in a bathroom. I prefer there to be like no light or tons of light but blue light. So I've been holding it since New York City this morning. I kid you not. I did say to the two of them, there are two bathrooms back there, and they, they've never traveled with me. We've never done this show before. Get to I Bryce Harper. All right, fine. Here we go. It's totally normal. Extension. No, are we ready to start? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Extension. That's the nothing personal word of the night, extension. As in what Bryce Harper thinks that he's gonna get from your owner, John Middleton. If you're not a fan of the Philadelphia Phillies, let me give you some background to this. Bryce Harper is a guy who's playing at Citizens Bank Park right now. He's a guy who used to play for the Nationals, then he came to the Phillies, then the Nationals won the World Series, then the Phillies did not. But the Phillies have been very good. They lost in the World Series two years ago, they lost in the LCS last year, and they are supposed to be very good this year, and they're playing their fourth game, and Bryce Harper's looking for his first hit. He has two home runs. Does he really? We're live, baby! Ready? It's so good. 4-8-69. Extension. What I think Bryce Harper should get from the Philadelphia Phillies. He has been so good this year. Does he really have two home runs? Okay. Hello, Coca. No, I'm just kidding. 
No, I do want to talk about it. I don't quite get the whole thing in, in your line of work, and this is what I wanted to talk about to the people listening. And this is, I'm so thankful that you're all here, and I mean that. There's going to be a lot more people who will listen to the episode than actually see it live. So you're, I'm, I, I respect what you're doing way more than anyone listening. And if you're just listening to this, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> it's amazing. And if you're watching on the Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel, awesome. We're on DraftKings Network every day, 10 a.m. Thank you. Back to the show. Here's what I don't get. In your line of work, if you're good at what you do, maybe a year-end bonus, maybe a 3% raise, maybe a 5% raise. I'm a little like Aaron Brooks right now. <laughs> don't worry, don't panic. Three of you saw broadcast news, thank God. <laughs> Bryce Harper signed a third time. I'm literally schwitzing up here, Coca. Can you do something? <laughs> Anybody? Oh, I'm here till nine. You can bet your bippy on that. I don't care if I go through three shirts and end up naked. So Bryce Harper signed a 13-year contract, and here's the thing about Bryce Harper's contract. Wait, comedians sweat all the time, don't they? That's totally normal. Um, you know what? I'm embracing it. DraftKings will edit it out anyway. The rules they have for editing. Mar I'm, I'm doing the London Marathon in two weeks. Uh, which is obscene and absurd because I haven't earned the starting line. I was supposed to do 20 miles yesterday. I only ended up doing 13 because I didn't want to be sore for today because I use my legs a lot during the show. So I really felt it was important that I was in tip-top shape. Bryce Harper signs a 13-year deal, and shockingly, he doesn't ask for an opt-out. An opt-out is what all these players are getting now, which is benefit to only the player. It means if they're good, they get to say, okay, I want a new contract, I want to make more money, and I'll go to a different team if I have to. And if they're bad, they stay on the team they're on and they keep being bad, getting paid what they were originally going to get paid. We did one opt-out in my 18 years. One opt-out was Giancarlo Stanton, and it was an opt-out of a 13-year, $325 million deal. And the negotiation with Stanton was pretty simple. I was with him in Beverly Hills at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I asked him, we did a whole meeting that lasted hours with all of his agents and reps and tons of people from the Marlins. I pulled him aside, and he and I are not the same size. And uh, so when I really have to be serious with Stanton, also a true story, I stand on something. Because I don't like the dynamic of Dudley Moore and Susan Anton, or in your parlance, table four, that's anyone short and anyone tall. And uh, so with Stanton, when I talk to him, I like stand on a chair. And so that's when he knows that, all right, we're talking about something serious now. Because other, otherwise, his neck hurts, my neck hurts, nothing gets accomplished. And I said, Giancarlo, we're going to offer you something that you can't say no to. And he said, there is no offer that I can't say no to. And I said, let's get right to the offer that you won't say no to. And he said, well, give me 13 years, $325 million, and I won't say no to that. That is how the Giancarlo Stanton contract got negotiated. And it was, I get credit for negotiating such a great deal. That's the joke of it. I did nothing. He said, here's what I'll do to not say no. The owner had told me, make sure he doesn't say no. I thought I was in the clear, like in the price is right, in the green. Like I can say to the owner, he didn't say no. Stanton has the biggest deal in history and the commissioner's calling me wanting to know what drugs I'm taking. That call also happened. Because when you sign a player to a contract, you submit it to the commissioner of baseball, and he has to approve it. The commissioner's office, little known fact here, approves every contract. In addition, little known fact, the commissioner's office approves every financial plan of every incoming owner. Just a little nugget for those of you who thought that when the Marlins were bought by the current owner and they traded Giancarlo Stanton, that the commissioner didn't know about that in advance. That's not true. Sorry, Rob, you knew about it because you submit your financial plan to baseball of what you're going to do when you buy a team. And the financial plan, when it has a payroll of X and then it has a list of players that add up to X and you look at the list, oh, let's look at who's on the team now versus who's on the list. And if the names are different, that means those players are going to get traded. It's not brain surgery. That's the thing about baseball. It's not brain surgery. So Stanton signs the $325 million deal. We agree to it. We walk back in, and his agent 
is told about the deal and his agent says, hold on, we need an opt-out. And I said, we don't do opt-outs. We've never done opt-outs. We're not gonna do it for Giancarlo. Giancarlo starts looking at me and I said, we've never done it. We, we're not gonna start now, it's precedent. We simply won't do it. <coughs> to make a very long story short, in about three seconds, we agreed to the opt-out. <laughs> Giancarlo basically said, I want the opt-out, and the agent explained why. He wanted the opt-out in case our team wasn't good enough, and he wanted to go to a place where he could win. The irony of ironies. Yes, he's a Yankee. Hello, anybody? The Yankees have not won since he got there. Now, he's been good, he's been much maligned, he's gonna have a great year this year. Does he have two home runs tonight, Coca? No. So Bryce Harper does the 13-year deal. He doesn't even want the bright, he doesn't even want the Giancarlo opt-out. He wants zero because he wants you to know in Philadelphia he's committed to you. That's his point of view. I believe in this ownership. I believe in this city. He had never been here. He had been here like in the in the Weston Hotel where we all stay. I mean, it's not, oh, all of a, I love the school system. These players are super funny about that when they sign free agent deals to try to convince you that they really want to be where they're signing. All of Boris's clients did it this offseason. All the guys who couldn't get contracts, like Bellinger went to the Cubs and Montgomery went to the Giants and, no, no, Snell went to the Giants. Where did Montgomery go that he's not pitching? Diamondbacks, of course. Reminds me of my favorite Manny Machado story when he signed $300 million with the San Diego Padres a few years ago, and he said the reason is he really liked their minor league system. <laughs> we once had someone named uh, Mike Hampton, if you remember that name. I really love the school system in Atlanta. Couldn't name one school. <laughs> Literally couldn't name a school. Went with like PS69. Every town has that. He's like, that's a really good school. So Bryce Harper is signed, he's been here six years, and for whatever reason, he believes it's time to now get an extension. He has seven years left to go. So I ask everyone listening at home and everyone here, if you do well at your job and you're under contract, do you feel that you would walk into your boss immediately after just actually doing your job and say, hey, how about a raise? You're willing to do that, aren't you? You should fight for yourself, you go in and ask for a raise. If you're under contract for three more years, do you go in and ask for an extension of that contract? Maybe. What do you do if the head of your company, the head of HR says no? You go back and do your job. These are clean towels that have dog hairs on them. Just notice that. <laughs> I may stop the show now, actually. <laughs> Mike, there's dog hairs on the damn towel. Bryce Harper. <laughs> the problem is your owner. John Middleton's a good owner. If you've met him, he's a good man. I spent a lot of time with him. He says things, it's, owners are really funny people. I wanna spend some time talking about owners and professional sports because you look at them so strangely. Like general genuflecting when you're around them and then hatred when you're not around them. And when your team's good, it's because the players are good. And when the team's bad, it's because the owner's bad. It's a very weird dynamic that people have with owners. And it's also weird with team presidents. I don't quite understand it all. I don't pitch or hit. I do my best choosing players. I listen to people who know more than I and then overrule them when they disagree with me, which is exactly what everyone else does. It seems totally normal. So John Middleton, the owner of your team, he was so excited when he was in the World Series. I don't know if you remember that. He was like a kid in a candy store. And he gave a quote that ended up making the rounds in the inner circle in, in baseball. He said, you know, Bryce Harper's underpaid. I should have paid him more. That's how good he is. And he got a call, I'm sure, from the labor department in Major League Baseball saying, listen, sonny boy. We appreciate your exuberance about your player, but do us a favor and stop with talking about the fact that a guy under contract for an outrageous amount that we didn't want you to do in the first place is now underpaid. And he's represented by Scott Boras. So, boo. Do you guys know him? Do you guys know Scott Boras? Let me tell you, 
He's really good at what he does because he knows how to get owners to do things that they think they want to do even though they don't. And they're told by people who know better that they shouldn't, but yet they look at Scott and say they will. It is the most bizarre power that he has. He goes into this moment when he's talking to you that you get into a trance because you're so bored and disgusted that you end up saying, it's like when you're on a date with someone that doesn't interest you and they say, hey, do you want to come home with me? And you thought, they just said, hey, do you want to go home? So you're like, yes. And the next thing you know, you're like, oh shit. I, can't, I thought I was just going home. That was my plan. Sorry, mark that, Coco. That's what Boris does. I'm having my son watch old movies. He's watching Old School. Never saw that. I tried to explain him. If you've ever seen Old School, it's a fantastic movie. If you've never seen it, it's, it's outstanding. Will Ferrell is in the movie. And there's a moment when Will Ferrell is asked a question about global thermonuclear war or some such thing that he wouldn't know how to discuss. Oh, no, that's War Games. Whatever. He's just asked a question about something. And uh, the best way is not to play. And he goes into this trance and he says stuff and then he breaks out of the trance and people say, hey, like, how did you know how to talk about that subject? And he says, I don't know, it just, I lost my mind. That's what nothing personal is for me. I, it, I swear to you, I don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> sorry. The show ends, people are like, oh, I loved when you said that about John Doe and I said, who? <laughs> I don't even think I did that. So John Middleton wants to spend stupid money on your team and for whatever reason, you're happy with it until they finish in last place and then you'll be unhappy with it. I don't know why you do that. The Philly is not this year, but it's cyclical. Sports is cyclical. I don't know why you all don't see that. For everybody but the Dodgers, sports is cyclical. <laughs> everybody. And the Bulls in the 90s. Thank God for gambling. It gave us a shot as Knicks fans. Do you remember, are there any old Philly people in here? Like over 56, anybody? Okay, like one of you, that's awesome. <clears throat> I'm so happy, oh, lie, please. And uh, there was an announcer for Sixers games, Julius Irving, Dave Zinkoff, Cuddy. Okay, thank you. I gotta keep talking about your owners here. I'm fascinated by your owners. You've got the owners of the Sixers. The Sixers are played. Joel Embiid may come back. They're going to test the knee out before the play-in tournament. Very important. Just so you know, when we tell you that we're having players test stuff out, we're lying to you. They've already tested it out. We don't test it out during games. That is asinine. Hey, here's an idea. Go ahead and throw 98 miles an hour. Let's see how your shoulder feels in a game situation. That's what Joel Embiid may be doing. He's gonna test it, see how he feels. It's, and you are like, oh, that's awesome. I'm gonna go to nothing personal instead. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. So the owners of the Sixers, I think you know, the owner of the Sixers, Josh Harris, David Blitzer. David Blitzer, who's married to my aforementioned sister, graduate of Penn, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. If you're listening, you're not enjoying. She, she listened to every show, my sister, and she, w I'm sorry? Your sister's friend, your sister's friend was married to him. Yes, sorry, my sister's friend was married to David Blitzer, not my sister. I conflated that, we're live. Nancy did listen to every show. She and my dad both passed away. They both listened to every show and they both liked calling after every show. Hey, that was really good except this part. Nancy was way nicer than my dad. I miss the calls, but I have no governor anymore because I just assume, oh, I guess everything was good because I didn't hear when things were bad. So your owner is David Blitzer and Josh Harris, and you may know that Josh Harris made the news because he decided to buy the Washington Commanders. And so as fans of the Sixers, are you worried that there's no focus because he's so worried about the commander's now in that six and a half billion dollar purchase. Well, I'd like to assuage any concerns you may have that Josh Harris is paying the exact same amount of attention as he was prior to buying the commanders. And I, the reason I know that is what Blitzer does and what they do, what Harris does, they go around and they're very good at this. There's a lot of owners in the business who do this. It's become an amazing ego asset. 
And so what they're doing is they're collecting things the way people used to collect art or collect stamps. There are people now who collect sports teams. And so they go across the pond and they're buying soccer teams. And if they can't get an EPL team, then they buy a second level team. And then they're looking into buying an MLS team. And then they want to get an NBA team. And that's Fenway Sports Group, Boston. That's what they're doing. And all the fans of the Boston Red Sox were doing a show in Boston. I'm going to basically do the same show, except I'm going to insert John Henry's name instead of Josh Harris. What jo it's amazing how little work I have to do. Hold on, I got to mark that. I can totally keep page three for Boston. That's awesome. We're such a lean show that I literally taped the stuff to the card before the show. That was me, like, remembering to bring tape. I remembered everything but chapstick, and I had Coca, like, cut off the top of his chapstick so I could use a little bit of it. <laughs> I'm not exactly going to share chapstick with anyone. I'd share a bed with someone sooner than I'd share chapstick. So they're collecting teams, Josh Harris is. And what's fascinating about what they're doing in your city is what they're doing with the Wells Fargo Arena. You know, they just put $400 million into that arena. I don't know if you've been there recently. There's a lot of teams playing there. They're testing Embiid's knee there tonight. And they did renovations just a couple of years ago. Flyers. Flyers play there as well. Yes, they do. And... If you've noticed the renovations, it's great. The renovations, but you don't have to cover your mouth when you're talking. I see that it's you. Kind of oh, well, we're gonna give you a camera. We're gonna give you a microphone when we do this so you wanna talk to Samson. You're gonna to get to ask questions. That's gonna be a segment. It's supposed to start approximately 30 minutes into the show. I'm supposed to be on page four at eight o'clock. <laughs> All right, stay calm. Coca's Googling stuff right now. <laughs> Literally, I think. What, what website are you on right now, Coca? I shouldn't say. <laughs> I told you. That is what he's doing. He's... <laughs> Let's just say he may not make the train later tonight. I'll be there, but he will be there. Never missed a show. We're going to have another show tomorrow live at 8 a.m., just like we had a show this morning live at 8 a.m. We do shows. It's what we do every day because of our audience, and we will keep doing it. No question. So what fascinated me about the whole Wells Fargo situation is that you know there's about to be a fight in your city over public financing for a new arena. And the fight has already started. And it doesn't matter how rich Josh Harris is or how many billions Blitzer's worth or Harris. What matters is that you don't do these deals without public money. And it's one of the things that I'm most known for is getting public money in Miami to build Marlins Park. Thank you. That's exactly the amount of applause I get in Miami for that. <laughs> It literally, total silence, like, you bastard. You took from me. No, we didn't. It's tourist tax. I'm putting that on my tombstone. It was just tourist taxes. No one gets that. They assume, like, oh, it's part of their property tax. No, it's the grade A school system in Miami that's on your property tax. So they're going to go to you for money. And there's a bunch of this going on right now in the country. There's a ballot happening right now. Spoiler alert, when we did the show in Philadelphia, April 2nd, there is a ballot measure. So Coca, if you're on the website and you have any early returns in Kansas City right now about whether they want to do a very funny thing in Kansas City, which is they're pretending that it's nothing, but they are trying to create a half penny sales tax. But the way it's being marketed, of course, and look for this in a town near you, they're marketing it as, hey, it's just an extension of what we already have. That's always how we frame it. Everything's in the wording. It's so important. In Kansas City, there is a penny tax or a half penny tax that expires in about seven years. And what that means is all of the money that was then available because of this half penny tax disappears. The revenue stream is gone. What they're voting for in Kansas City right now is to stop that current half penny tax that expires in 31, create a new one that'll last 40 years from now. And so I did a quick math. What they're really saying is keep the one till 2031 and then give me an extra 33 years. Present value all the money, give it to me so I can renovate Arrowhead and I'll take all the revenue while the Royals leave Kauffman Stadium and get a brand new stadium downtown. Deal? And that's how ballots work. They talk really fast. 
they do it totally negative versus positive, where you think you're voting no, but you're voting yes. You think you're voting yes, but you're voting no. You don't even know what the hell you're doing. You read, have you ever read one of your ballots? I hope you all vote. And there's always ballots at the end of every voting initiative, and they're always long. And how many of you, I'm doing an informal poll, how many of you read the first two sentences and the last sentence and just decide, eh, don't need to read the middle? You can deny because you want to look smart to me. <laughs> We've done the research. <laughs> you all do it. Have you ever noticed why ballots are really long except the ones that are fairly obvious? Like there was one where I lived recently. The ballot issue was sort of simple. Do you want people who move here to pay more tax than you do? Yeah, seems like an easy one, and I'm reading it twice because I'm used to people doing things opposite. I feel like I'm getting screwed in some way, half Jewish, well, fully Jewish, and so I just assume like there's something wrong, like this can't be that easy. It turns out that was a real ballot question. Guess what, it totally passed, <laughs> which is amazing. Did you guys watch Caitlin Clark? Oh no, I gotta breathe, Sarah, hold on. No, no, so, here we go. Did you guys watch Caitlin Clark last night? Yeah. Isn't that unreal? There were like 12 million of you who watched. Is that the first women's basketball game you've watched from start to finish? I'll admit it. I watched it start to finish, and it was the first one I've watched start to finish since last year's LSU-Iowa game, which was the winning game for LSU. And so I found myself watching, and I was fascinated by the conversation, this is where things will get dicey, and either you'll stick with me or you'll order more drinks. Um, Caitlin Clark, great player, no doubt about it. Love watching her play. It is a force right now. She is a commerce force. She's attracting money from everywhere because there is some belief by people, and this is always interesting because I used to sell sponsorships when you run a team, you are trying to convince people to give us your marketing budget because fans, for whatever reason, when they see that Coke is the official beverage of the Marlins, they'll say, oh, I like Coke, a cola. It seems weird. Like if you're a Pepsi guy, I don't think you're gonna say, oh, but the Marlins are a Coke building. I'm gonna switch to Diet Coke now. But I always say they will. So that's the thing about brands. So Caitlin Clark is signing these deals. NIL is now available which is really cool. College students can make money the way they should be allowed to. I'm very, very much in favor of college students being able to make money. And I think that people just have it wrong when talking about NIL, and there's a ton of legislation, there's a ton of debate about this subject. When you really dig deep into NIL, it is an argument that you're hearing a lot of academics say, we don't want the students to be employees. We want the students to be students. And what they're not telling you is that the students on financial aid actually have to be employees under work study programs. They're not telling you all the people and all the jobs that are happening on campus. And they're not telling you the amount of money they're making off students who are athletes. And the reason why, you can applaud only in that it's true. But I also don't agree that students should be allowed to form a union. I also don't agree that we should refer to them as anything other than student athletes. And the reason why is that it shouldn't matter to me if you are Caitlin Clark playing in front of 12.3 million people or if you are on the water polo team playing in front of your mother. I believe both of them have their virtues in college athletics. That is the genesis of amateur athletics. It is people who work their whole lives to attain a certain level and sometimes it's to be a division one athlete. Some people wanna be pros, but it's super hard to be a pro. The majority of people aren't. Hint, your children are not gonna be professional baseball players. I promise you. I just get so many, side note, I got a DVD story for you. This is a true story. My son played Little League and I would get DVDs from parents who thought their kids were super good and wanted me to watch it as though I gave a flying rat's pituitary gland about their nine-year-old playing baseball and I would immediately throw it away because I would have, oh my, literally I can think of a million things I'd rather do than watch a DVD of my son's friend play baseball, like having the ball hit him in the teeth. Oh, but look at how good he was at dodging the ball. 
people think, oh, you're the president of a team, my kid's gonna be good. No. So college athletes, 12.3 million of us watched Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, and all I kept focusing on was LSU's coach in the green suit, who I've done a ton of segments on and nothing personal, and I've gotten her name wrong every time, and I have nothing in front of me right now. Her name is Kim Mulkey. Mulkey. I called her Mulvey, Mulva, Malacky, and I don't do it to be funny, I do it because I loved Wisconsin. Yes, thank you, Mom. Yes, I did enjoy a party from now and again. I was told to breathe during the show. I never breathe during Nothing Personals. Coke, I'm doing it. People are gonna like this episode. I'm breathing, I'm inhaling. I'm, <laughs> I do inhale, it is true. Taking a moment. Who, who is Clinton's PR guy, sorry. I never had sexual, what? What does that even mean? Never inhaled. I like people who said that like in college. I never inhaled it. Like they have a big doobie. Why is it that people think, this is what PR people do in sports. We think you're all stupid. And it's so embarrassing, I hate it. It's why I love nothing personal. Because I get to tell you things that are real that are happening behind the scenes because I've been in meetings where we're going through a PR plan and the basic, the basis of the PR plan is that our fan base are morons. And I don't know why that's the sort of set position, default position, that's the word I was looking for. You're not, but yet you wanna believe what we say. It's such a strange thing. Do you do that in other parts of your life? I'm asking sort of all the audience, not just here, but who's listening. Do you default just believe what people say and that's how you go through life? Or do you sort of look askance and say, hmm, let me dig into that. I'm not sure I'm buying what you're selling. I'm far more on the latter side than the former and I am a cynic and it is well earned because I've seen some stuff that would make your eyes water. And the PR, that teams give you about injuries, the PR that teams give you about who they're going after, who they're trading for, all the stuff about sports and what, what Joel Embiid is doing tonight. It's just meant for you to think that we know what we're doing. And if you actually went into the room where it happens, you would not believe that Hamilton would do a song about it because there is no document coming out of it. It's a bunch of general imbeciles who are being overpaid who are trying to be important. That's what we do in these rooms. And it's not that, that you couldn't do what I did, because you could. I just got an opportunity to do it because of nepotism. That's it. That's the only difference between me and you, is that I was born on third base. That's it. But the real difference happened is when I decided I would spend my whole life stealing home. And I never told anyone, hey, I'm satisfied at third base. So that Hamilton song I agree with is that I am never gonna be satisfied. It's why I'm willing to be this uncomfortable. I was texting with Dan Levitar before the show as he was wondering, wondering what am I doing? Like why are you doing this? Why are you making yourself sick with indigestion and Gaviscon required? That was on my green room list. Like people want like lines of coke and girls. I wanted Gaviscon and tissues and sanitizer. <laughs> True story, my tour promoter thinks I'm an idiot. He's like, David, think bigger. I said, all right, like. No, where is it? Oh shit, it's dropping. <laughs> Can I get the Bath and Body Works sanitizer? Like that's, I said, no, it's fine, I'll bring my own. Extension. <laughs> Sorry. This is actually happening for those of you not watching. I can't quite see what I'm doing. Josh Harris. Wells Fargo. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about this one. Are you guys fans of A Rod? How come? Give me the top three reasons, because he's not a Philly, 
totally ridiculous. There's like a million reasons to not like A-Rod, and that is not one of them, because he's not a Philly. I thought you were gonna come up with like so many amazing reasons why not to like him. He wasn't a Philly, great. Arrogant. Steroids. Wait, did I just hear Jeter? Who said he's not Jeter? What is your name? Andrew, have you ever met Derek Jeter? Okay, was it in a bar on the Upper East Side? Did you get in his limo? No, sir. All right. No gift basket. No gift basket for you. That gift basket is true. The gift basket when we sold the team to Jeter for $1.2 billion was a big nothing burger. Got no gift basket from Jeter. Just a big F you. I got a text on my phone that I was fired. That's what I got from Derek Jeter. Still haven't spoken to him. He was trying to seduce me the entire sales process, thinking that I was so excited he was Derek Jeter, which I wasn't, didn't care. Let's get back to A-Rod. Steroids. Is it the steroids or the fact that he lied? Lied. lied. Cover up worse than the crime. We all agree with that. My problem with A-Rod, other than the fact that I've spent plenty of time with him, is all about being disingenuous. I like people who are interested and interesting. I like people who want to learn. I like people who take their situation and try to improve it, whether it's financially, spiritually, reading a book, watching a movie. Gaviscon. I'm true. This is what you don't see when I film in front of no one. It's called the mute button, which wasn't part of the package with City Winery. Yes, there's a lot of belching, there's coughing, there's all sorts of stuff going on, and I'm not wearing pants. True, when I film nothing personal, I'm in shorts. I actually talked to the promoter, can I come out in my shorts? And he said it's an elevated stage and you may have a situation. And I said, it's Samson. There's no situation. Trust me, it will be totally fine. He said, let's just make sure and wear pants. So I schlep pants on Amtrak and now I'm completely soaked through like a six month old and I could have been in flip-flops. I bought my shoes online. They don't fit, but I'm too stubborn to return them because I don't know how to return them because I'm a boomer, so I'd rather have my toes crinkled, have shoes that don't fit, than have to A, throw my shoes away, or B, admit that they don't fit, and I'm so freaking stubborn that I decided to wear them for my first show ever, knowing that my toes would kill me, but hey, they're gonna look good, and that is a true story about my shoes. They literally are online. What were we talking about? A -Rod. No. A-Rod. Thank you, Coca. I don't mind. A-Rod always came up to me and said, hey, I want to learn about owners. I want to be an owner. Tell me. Tell me about, give me a scattering report. What's Jerry Reinsdorf like? No, tell me about all the owners. He wanted to buy a team. He so badly he's always wanted to buy a team. It's, it's like he thought that that would be his raison d'etre was to own a team and he always wanted to buy the Marlins, except they were never for sale until they were. And then Derek Jeter wanted to buy the Marlins, and then Derek Jeter and A-Rod didn't like each other, so they would bid against each other, numbers that were totally unreasonable, had nothing to do with what the team was worth, but it didn't matter because it was never their money. Because the way to get rich is not by salary, which we've all had jobs, you get rich by owning stuff. I own 0% of the Marlins, for the record, if you're out there listening. So here's the thing. A-Rod, what bothered me most about him is that not only did he lie about steroids, but then he tried to cover it up to the point where he was willing to sue the commissioner of baseball. And I've been on the receiving end of a bunch of lawsuits, a lot of them, tons of them. For, I don't really lose lawsuits. I mean, I'll settle once in a while, like the slip and falls at the ballpark. It depends, we've got cameras on you. If you're trying to make money at the ballpark, just know we've got a camera on you. Like if you get hit with a foul ball, just know that we can zoom in on you and we can see if you're on your phone. And then you're not gonna get anything. I'm principal alone. And we can see if you slip and fall, there's people who actually drop, I kid you not, they drop the ice cream and then slip on it. We've seen it on video. We have cameras, we're watching. It's Orwell. It's Billy Baldwin, it's Sharon Stone. We are watching, that's a reference that there is no chance that anyone gets. Literally no chance and I'm fine with it. What's the name of the movie? Sliver. That is prime Sharon Stone. <sighs> A -Rod. 
A-Rod. Thank you. Would you come back to do the 8 a.m. show tomorrow in my apartment? Just like sit, sit there on the couch and say, oh, A-Rod. <laughs> you, you, he already is, actually. He's been here a lot of hours. He's not coming to any of the other shows in any of the other cities except New York because he's so devoted to nothing personal and he's got to be in, in front of a special soundboard and he produces the show at 8 a.m. every morning and he doesn't want to do it from a hotel room because he thinks it will sacrifice what our audience has gotten to know and appreciate every day at 8 a.m. So I will be alone. Thank you, Coca. That is worthy of an applause. And so... I end up having to actually, uh, I'm going alone to all these cities, which is not, I'm not inviting you, mom, I'm sorry. I know that was what you were about to say. I love you, come to New York, but I'm good. But because I, all I want is just chapstick and, and I want sanitizer. I got a top five for you. Oh, let me finish the A-Rod story. Here's the thing. When I met him and he was negotiated by the Marlins, all he wanted to do was own a team. That's it, didn't care about the financials didn't care to look at what the team was worth, didn't care about his partner's money. And then the next thing I know, he doesn't get the Marlins, and he's buying the Minnesota Timberwolves, and then pretending that he likes Minnesota. And I'm a Midwest guy. I'm in. I love Milwaukee. I love Minnesota. I can even count to 10,000. Went to Horace Mann. A lot of lakes. I love them all. Alex Rodriguez going on social media from his house in Minnesota telling you how much he loves Minnesota. Slightly disingenuous. And I'm only going to say it because I've met him. Not happy in Minnesota. And now what you're hearing about every day is the fact that they're no longer the owners of the Timberwolves because they couldn't come up with the money to finish buying the team. And if you listen to previous episodes of Nothing Personal, I've gone into detail about what actually happened, what a step transaction is. It's when you buy something like an installment plan and you take control with the last installment, and if you don't come up with the last installment, sorry, you're a limited partner. You're not the control person. So what A-Rod has decided to do, which is just classic A-Rod, which is what bothers me, is that he's on the offensive now. He's going on every podcast, not nothing personal, it's just, it's me, I don't, it's good, I'm okay. To the bookers out there, we're good. And he's going on the podcast and he's saying, we are going to fight. I don't care if it takes five years or ten years. We're going to do nothing but fight because we care about the fans of Minnesota. And he keeps a total straight face when he says that. And he says that the fans in Minnesota are suffering because the owner didn't sell A-Rod the team. In a salary cap sport, I've got one bit of news for you, and basketball is one of them. When they tell you to trust the process... In a salary cap sport, that process is not directly correlated to the number of years it takes to actually be good again. What it takes is not having recency bias. That is the only thing that you should want your owners to have. You should want your owners not to make emotional decisions, period. Because emotional decisions are bad ones, and owners do it all the time. The 30-minute rule is something you should all do. 30 minutes, coincidentally, we have 34 minutes left. Oh no, what time do we go until? Nine o'clock, right, Coca? All right, 34 minutes. They're gonna have you close, have at least one more drink if you're taking the train. Are you guys okay? Everyone okay? We're fine? All right, thank you. It's just me up here, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. 30 minute rule, it's a really good rule. Our owner, we had an owner, his name was Jeffrey Lurie and not Jeffrey Lurie. That's like the fifth most common question I get asked. Oh, did you work for the Eagles? No, totally different guy. Jeffrey Lurie, Jeffrey Loria, different people. 30 minute rule is simple. Whenever something good happens to you, don't do anything for 30 minutes. Whenever something bad happens to you, don't do anything for 30 minutes. Follow my rule and you will have a good life. Don't follow my rule and you will make mistakes. Trust me on this. How do I know? Imagine that you're with someone on a date and things are going really, really well. It's the first date, the second date, you think like, all right, you know, I got a shot here. And like you're in this feeling of this amazing moment and you just blurt out like, do you want to get married? Like you're, you're skipping ahead like 10 steps because you're so excited for this moment. 
or you're with your spouse or you're with your business partner and you're having a disagreement about something and you're having just a normal disagreement that happens in everyday life and right after the disagreement you say, I want a divorce, I want to end this partnership. The 30 minute rule makes you do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. Violating the 30, 4, 8, 69. Violating the 30 minute rule makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do. In sports world, when a player blows a save and the owner calls and says, trade that player, literally after the winning run scores, that's called an emotional response. When your player hits a walk-off home run and the owner calls and says, hey, let's sign him to an extension, that's an emotional call. We had a 30-minute rule. Very easy. We would not make decisions about our team within the first 30 minutes of every game. No matter what happens, win or lose, no decisions within 30 minutes. And as I sit here right now with 32 minutes to go, I don't know why that story came to my head. It's not on any page, but it is a rule that we had. I watch a movie, oh, hold on, damn, sorry, sir. I watch a movie every day, true story, every single day. I review one on Nothing Personal, as you all know. Do I have to say we're gonna go to break now, Sarah? Because this is a regular episode. All right, I'll do it. It's not going on the network, so no, you don't have to. Nice. Just get to it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Coca. Top five Philly movies. This is my top five movies associated with Philly. Excuse me. Would you guys be totally upset if Rocky were not on this list? Number five. The Sixth Sense. When I watch The Sixth Sense, that is one of those movies that I've only watched once. There's a bunch of movies like it, like Schindler's List, The Sixth Sense. There's movies that you just, you're like, wow, that's a really good movie, but Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, one time. In Sleepers, one time. Really good movie, don't wanna see that again. Really like that movie, I haven't seen it. Number four, National Treasure. Shocking but true, that's a Philly movie, like Declaration of Independence, Independence Hall, it's filmed all sorts of places. I love Nicolas Cage. Now, National Treasure does not make my top five Nicolas Cage movies, interestingly enough, but it does make my top five Philly movies. My top five Nicolas Cage movies. Not ready for that one, but I'll tell you what would be on it. Valley Girl, for sure. Lord of War. Would, would be in my top five. See, I don't count that, as, I don't count Fast Times as a Nicolas Cage movie, but he is in it. it. Before he got his teeth. Moonstruck's a great movie, Oscar for Cher. Number three, I'm gonna do an imitation for number three and you're gonna, you're gonna know exactly what it is. Bacon, as in bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Trading places. Trading places. You're referring to the movie where they want bacon, he wants toast, there's no toast available, so he orders bacon, lettuce, and tomato, hold the bacon, hold the lettuce, hold the tomato, and out comes toast. I've used that at a restaurant and it totally works. It is the most bizarre thing. That's when you're doing your job. Let me tell you a separate story about leading people who are game day employees who you deal with every day when you go to, when you go to games. The most important thing to do with your game day employees is to empower them. They've gotta be able to take care of a situation. If a kid drops an ice cream cone, get him another ice cream. And there were codes that we had at every concession stand where the employee could put in the code and we would know at the end what the code was and that it was a replacement ice cream, let's say. Empowering your employees to do things is so important. I don't know what that has to do with trading places at all, but it was something in my head. Number two, top five Philly movies, Rocky. It's only number two. Now, why is it only number two? I, do you actually know? All right, someone just yelled out, and this is true. What is your name? What is your name? Stevie. Stevie? Did you just yell out Silver Linings Playbook as my number one Philly movie? Silver Linings Playbook, the one with De Niro and Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence? That's, okay. Now I know your taste in movies. The number one movie for Philly Silver Linings Playbook. 
I swear to God, it's right there. Read it. What does it say? Silver Linings Playbook. I kid you not. All right, we want to get to a segment now. It's called So You Want to Talk to Samson. So You Want to Talk to Samson is where I get questions on davidsampsonpodcast.com or on Twitter, David P. Samson, and people submit questions. And we get some funny ones, and not all of them make the air. I try to respond to as many DMs as possible, and I do, um, but not everyone. But I do respond to more than, than is probably normal, but it helps that I don't sleep a lot. And it also, just because we DM, don't assume that I'm going to recognize you. So also that. For any time you meet someone you've DM'd with, just introduce yourself. Coca thinks you're all bots anyway. That's what he always says to me. Every time I say, oh, is this person real? Nope. Damn. I gave a speech at Penn State University. Cuddy knows it. I gave a speech at Penn State University. Can I tell you a very quick story about Penn State University? It's here, in, it's here in Pennsylvania. It's only a couple hours from here. And so I'm a Badger, and I was in State College, and I gave a speech, a keynote at a sports business conference. And I'm talking about business and leadership and all sorts of things about my past and my path and my journey because they're all 20 to 23 years old, and they feel like they have to be already in their 50s. And they don't. They've got decades to go. And so after the speech, there were people come up, introduce, give me, they give me a, an email. I'd like to stay in touch with you. And I tell them the same thing, which is 80% of you will never contact me and 20% of you will. And that's sort of the, the math always. 20% of the people do 80% of the work in any job you ever have, in any company you ever live in, in any household. It's always the same, the 20-80 rule. And so after the speech, a very um, attractive couple approached me. And it was uh, two women and a guy. So a thruple maybe? I don't, it's college. I don't know what it was. And I thought I was being invited out like to a sorority party or fraternity party. I thought maybe drinks and I knew I had to get back to New York because I had a show the next morning. But I'm thinking like I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And she says, you know, it was so great to watch you, your speech, it was great. I really would love to introduce you to my father. <laughs> and I left, I literally left. I kid you not. So so you want to talk to Samson is when you have questions. And I want questions from you. And these, are, these will make the show. And I will repeat them uh, into the microphone so it will be on the feed. But does anyone have any questions that you would like me to answer? Yes. Hello, David. Hello. How are you? I am well, thank you. What is your name? Andrew. We have a question from Andrew. Well, the question is, how do I feel about my character on the Levitard show? How do you know that this is not a character what you're seeing tonight? I don't think that somebody would, somebody would So let me tell you a little backstory for the people listening. I am part of the Levitard network. I'm part of Metal Arc Media. I license nothing personal to Metal Arc Media. I own all the IP. I own nothing personal. And so I actually can say whatever I want about Levitard and Metal Arc doesn't matter to me because frankly the show is worth more than what they paid for it so I would love it actually if this question involves them terminating the license early <laughs> so here we go how do I feel about Lebetard and the character it is the character that Lebetard feels the audience wants because he is under the mistaken impression that his audience gives a flying rat's ass about the Marlins that's the truth the Marlins was so many years ago that I am far more recognized for Survivor and nothing personal than I am as the former president of the Marlins. That was a job I had for a period of time a long time ago. But they have a Miami show, and it used to be a terrestrial radio show, which was based, it was a full Miami audience. What I say to Dan is you have a national following now, and the overwhelming majority of your fan base doesn't really care about what I did as president of the Marlins. It doesn't matter to them. And they're more interested in, in the, what we do. And I love doing the show I do with John Skipper, The Sporting Class. I'm doing another show tomorrow. It's a sports business show that we'll record that we do as often as we can. And uh, I love the different characters I get to play because in my heart, what I've always loved doing is performing. And I've always enjoyed it. And I always loved the feeling that I had for the last several hours, just the amazing feeling of sickness. I search for that. It is the weirdest thing to do, but I love to feel uncomfortable. I love to have tummy aches, hence the Gaviscon. And I love knowing that I feel that way because it means I'm doing something different. I'm doing something that's 
a change. And people are afraid of change, and you shouldn't be, because change is the only thing that I can promise you. But people generally shy away from it, and you end up doing the same thing over and over. So the character on Levitard, I spend a lot of time being different characters on Levitard. So if you'll notice, I do a segment Thursdays with Adnan that is a movie character where I let Adnan sort of be the alpha because it's important to him to be the alpha, and I don't care. I do a Wednesday hour with Levitard where we do some, if you listen to those shows, half of it is serious, half of it is jocular, and then there's a movie review. And then when there's a serious topic that happens or breaking news, then I'm yet a different character where I'll come on as a sports business expert, which is the same character that I play with Skipper on the sporting class. And then you've got the nothing personal character. Now, the trick for the audience is always to figure out, well, what's real? And I'm not a magician, so I'm happy to tell you. The answer is, I love my Levitard character. And the answer is, I love this character. I love every character I play. Because they're all me. So none of them, I'm, I'm, I'm acting none of it. It's just all different parts of me that I get to explore. So that is why Levitard does what he does. <coughs> yes. The question is, what's the dumbest thing I ever spent money on as president of the Marlins? What my word of the day was going to be stupid money, which is what John Middleton said he was going to spend. I have the exact answer that just came to my mind when you said it. That's a great question. What is the, mo the stupidest thing I ever spent money on? Heath Bell. All right, players aside, the ridiculous machine that Heath Bell wanted in the training room. True, he came in. Michael Morse did that to me, too. Michael Morse was a former national. Great, it's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. He said, for me to be good, I need this special machine. You're gonna, you get in it for like three seconds and you freeze your kishkas off and then you can play the next day. You're a runner, David, just try it. And it was like this crypto Austin Powers thing where you go pee pee like for an hour once you're out of it and you're totally freezing. And meanwhile, Mor Morse missed half the season. And it was like 30 grand not budgeted. And of course, players are like your children. They basically, when they don't like my answer, it's like when they don't like the answer from mom, they go to dad. So when they don't like my answer, they just went to the owner. And the owner, of course, never said no to anybody, ever. So then the players come back to me and say, why would I even talk to you? It's a total waste of my time. And then the owner would walk into the office and say, hey, we're getting this machine or that machine. They loved getting special pitching machines. That's the new thing now. The Phillies have one. They just talked about it on the air, it was fantastic. They now have pitching machines which actually don't just imitate the spin of a pitcher, but you see the picture of the pitcher. So you're in the batting cage facing whoever, just name, name a pitcher, Aaron Nola, although he's your pitcher, but that's what it would be if you're visiting, that you'd then face him. If it were true, then of course everyone would be getting more hits, wouldn't they? when you are looking, at, and they cost so much money, but what the players do is they say, this is the new technology, we gotta have it. We had that at every level of the company. The zero-based budget, it wasn't in my show, but I wanna talk about zero-based budget if you don't mind. Love the zero-based budget. Do you know what that means? That means you have to prove to me every year that you want and need your allocation. What most companies do, because their presidents are absolutely not paying attention, is they don't do a zero-based budget. They do a fixed-based budget with an increase over what it was last year, which causes an inordinate amount of fourth-quarter spending. If you are in sales, the best way to make the most money is to find companies in their fourth quarter who don't do zero-based budgeting because they've got to spend their entire marketing. They've got to spend it all. They've got to buy every piece of equipment. They have to show that, hey, you gave me a budget of Gimmel, and that's for you, Mike. You gave me a budget of Gimmel, and I spent it all, so now I need Gimmel plus hay. It's, it's preposterous. So when I came in to the Expos, I was young. I was a very young team president. I was uh, 30, 31 years old when I was named the executive vice president of the Expos, and the reason I was named executive vice president is I was so young that the existing limited partners of the Expos would not allow me to be called president. And so I was just named executive vice president, but I didn't report to anyone but the owner. Brilliant is, right? 
bunch of geniuses. It was like a Mensa convention up in Montreal with these guys. It was unbelievable. All right, I'm the EVP. You win. It's great. It's so funny to think about. And then they sued us. They didn't win, but they did sue us. Did you watch Pablo Torre Finds Out? Yeah. It's a great show. Thank you. Please watch that. There's an episode that came out today. Watch it, please. Um, he interviewed an attorney named Jeffrey Kessler recently. Jeffrey Kessler is a union hack attorney. Very good at what he does. Don't get me wrong. He cross-examined me for a whole bunch of time when we were sued by those same Canadian limited partners. The guy tried to ruffle me in the stand. I was on the stand for days, and he tried to ruffle me. And I, when, he, when the truth is on your side, you can't be ruffled. I don't know if you've ever figured that out when you're arguing with someone. If you don't lie, then you win. It's really that simple an equation. And so we did everything by the book because I operated a team for 18 years under a very simple principle that I was going to be sued every month in Gdanishtek. Every day there was going to be a lawsuit filed against me. Therefore, I had to cover my tracks completely and do everything totally by the book. It's a great way to operate. And it leads to an undefeated record in lawsuits. It certainly didn't stop people from suing. I am undefeated. So that's my Lebitard answer. Another, so you want to talk to Samson? Yes. If I could work for any MLB team other than the Marlins, currently, right now, uh, the answer is I, so let me give you the answer because that is the most commonly asked question of me is would you go back to running a team? And my answer is unequivocally no, because I've done it, it's too comfortable. We won a World Series, we lost 100 games, we signed players, we traded players, sold a team, bought a team, built a stadium, uh, hosted an all-star game. I mean, what, what, what didn't I do? And I don't mean that as a look at me, Louis, or as a flex. I mean it as a serious thing. What uh, is great, one, people say one for the thumb. The president of the Yankees, I gotta tell you about him. He's the COO, his name is Lon Trost, he's my size. I'm gonna stand up for this. He's lit. oh God. Oh God, I should have run. Oh my God, I'd be kidding too long, Coca. Coca, we're almost done. Don't worry. Okay. Lon Trost is my size. He's won a lot of rings with the Yankees. He wears every damn one of them to every owner's meeting. I kid you not, he wears them across every one of his fingers. That's how he can't function, can't eat, can't pick his teeth, can't do anything. He can't even write. You can't fit a pen in between eight rings. It's absurd. But he basically just sits here with tons of rings like, hi, I'm with the Yankees. So no, it wouldn't be the Yankees. Um, I wouldn't go back because I love, I love what I did. And uh, I'm very much Eddie Money in that regard. Um, I want to go back but you can never go back again. So then you stop wanting to go back and you embrace what you're going toward. And so my philosophy has always been, and maybe it's what keeps me running and, and training the way I do, is I'm always running towards something. I always say to people when I'm doing, you know, non-comedy routines is that I'm always running from things, running from people, like my therapist taught me that, but that's really not true. I'm always running towards stuff. I love the idea of what's next. And the occupational hazard of that is when you're an adrenaline junkie always running toward the next thing is you tend not to enjoy the current thing. It's the equivalent of when your family is on at a dinner on vacation and they spend the whole time planning the next dinner or the next vacation. And there's, if you don't know what that means, then you don't have family. That's just what people do. It's so strange to me. And I'm always, no, like, we'll talk about now. So I wouldn't, there's no team. You'd think I'd say the Dodgers because they can win every year or the Yankees because it's New York or the Mets because who wouldn't want to work for Steve Cohn? Um, no, I would not want to work for Steve Cohn. There's a couple of owners that I would not want to work for because uh, working for people who are not rational as a general principle is very tough, right? I always think about George Steinbrenner. I was lucky enough to know George Steinbrenner uh, and we beat the Yankees in 2003 and Steinbrenner was still alive, George the father of the current owner. And uh, he, he was a difficult man. And there are people who would work for the Yankees who would tell me stories that he would make people stay at their desk through the end of the game just on the hunch that he would want something or need something, wouldn't let them go home, wouldn't let them leave for lunch. You know, he operated by fear, thought that was the way. That was with all the firing of managers. He fired managers all the time. Later on, I said to Hal Steinbrenner, I wish your dad were alive because I could teach him how to fire managers all the time and have no one scared of you, ever because that's what I did. We went through like 20 managers and no one's ever scared of me, but George felt like, like he had to do it that way. 
And uh, note for Nashville, the manager bit, no. Manager didn't work, no response. I was sort of kidding when I said we're not looking for responses. Coke is taking copious notes on everything for the next show, which is on Monday in Atlanta. I'm actually going tomorrow morning, we'll do a show and then I'm going to Los Angeles to host the Rich Eisen show on Thursday and Friday. If you watch Rich Eisen, he's got a show on Roku and Sirius XM and he's taking two days off and asked me to sit in his chair. And so I'm going to sit in his chair and do his show. And uh, little does he know how the show's gonna go because what he called me and said, so listen, it's not nothing personal. And I said, it's the Rich Eisen show. He said, but do what you want. I said, great. I'll do a nothing personal at 5 a.m. Don't worry, I would never not do a show. I'm gonna do it at 5 a.m. from my hotel. Uh, I guarantee it, I'll do Levitard, don't worry. And then I'll do the Rich Eisen show. I don't know why that was in my mind either. So the answer is no, I don't wanna work for another team. <laughs> yes. Right. One of two, you can answer either one. Okay. Those are both good questions. You're asking me about schlepping newspapers, which I was a schlepper. And, uh, and you're asking me about would I be the same? And uh, it's funny you're asking that. I don't know uh, if you know this, but Levitard asked me that same question all the time. And he wonders because I've had a reckoning a bit with how I was as team president. And the problem I have off the record, just in front of this incredibly loyal audience who I'm so thankful is here, and I'll ignore everybody listening and watching on all the other channels, et cetera. Um, I just said, um, that's a verbal tick that I didn't, I don't do much. Have I done that a lot tonight? I don't think I've had a lot of ums, which is not bad for being out here for approximately 7.32 to 8.49 is 77 minutes without one of those. Not terrible, actually. And I stopped the flop sweat too, which is good. Do you know that when you're really accomplished in this business, they do your laundry for you after the show? <laughs> I shall be schlepping back on Amtrak, changing back into my sweats. The answer is I would have to do it the same because this sounds incredibly egomaniacal. There's a lot of things I did wrong as team president, a lot of things that I would do differently, but the lion's share I did right because I always was able, uh, my background in law made me able to see what's around the corner. And so I was able to be very predictive about how decisions would end up. Obviously you don't get every trade right, I'm not talking about that, but in terms of getting, getting a stadium done or figuring out how to sell a team or figuring out how you do certain things in PR. And I guess I would say this, that there are people who say, because they think it sounds better, you know, I do it all differently because they want you to think, oh, they're not made of wires or they're not robotic or they do have feelings or they do care about the fans. I gotta tell you, to be good at your job as a leader, you can't make everybody happy. And if your goal is to make everybody happy, you're just gonna be terrible at your job. And that's fine, there's plenty of people who can't be unpopular. That's never been my issue. I've had practice since like elementary school, right? So I have always been very good at that and it manifested by being a team president where it didn't impact me. And it's a question I get a lot where, how do you deal with the negative press? How do you deal with the vitriol? And uh, the answer is it never bothered me because it, it, it really never bothered me, which Dan thinks makes me crazy because it impacts him. Do you know, I'm gonna do my imitation of Dan Levitard. This is my imitation. Did you see what this person just tweeted at me? <laughs> that person didn't like that segment. David, we gotta change that segment. That person didn't like it. Dan, that's one person. What, 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 why are you even reading the comments? Hold on. That's two people. <laughs> this is what Levitar does to me. It's almost hard to imagine. I wanted him to come on tour with me and uh, he's not ready yet. He's too nervous because he's afraid that either there won't be a lot of people, which it doesn't matter how many people because I have such great respect, whether there's 10, 50, 100, 1,000. <clears throat> I did the same Nothing Personal, the first show I did on October 19th of, uh, 14th of 2019. My mother downloaded the episode and that was it. There was one download, but I treated it as though there were 50,000 and 100,000 or a million. 
It's the same as I view this, where it, I love, I love that we're getting to share tonight. I will never forget tonight. I will not. Uh, so thank you. Let me answer the second question before I go into my finale. And the second question was a quick story about schlepping newspapers, because Larry, I'm coming to you. The, you're the last, so you want to talk to Samson. Schleppy newspapers, what he's referring to is I came up with this great business idea because of how lucky I was and fortunate that I, oi, 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 I was in Europe and I couldn't get a Nick score. Oi, can you imagine how horrible that is? Running around Paris, getting the International Herald Tribune and seeing a score from a day later. Like, oi, the struggles. Bryce Harper, Grand Slam. Is that his third home run? Three home runs. That's so unreal. I would definitely give him the extension. I don't know. I wonder if John Middleton's gonna say anything. I thought, I thought the game was gonna get rained out, and it turns out it wasn't. I think you're lucky for Philly. I love Philly. I, I may go get another cheesesteak after the show. That's how good I feel. Gino's, is it, isn't that too touristy, or is that the place? Too touristy, I agree. We, we went to Reading Station where there were no tourists at all. I'm not sure, I don't even want to describe what the demographics were while I was eating my pre-show meal, which luckily there's no microphone south or else. Newspapers. newspapers. Couldn't get a score. I said, there's gotta be a better way. Literally what we did with my mother in a car Went to 86th Street and 3rd Avenue, bought newspapers Saturday night. The Sunday New York Times used to be printed on Saturday nights. Put the New York Times in the trunk of a car, then put it into a suitcase. Then I would fly coach to Europe. Okay. <laughs> Get the bags, go to a hotel, and say, excuse me, I'm David Sampson. All right, I'm good, no stroke. And I would say, would you like the Sunday New York Times? And they'd say, May aujourd'hui say dimanche, say par mercredi. I said that's the whole point. It's not Wednesday. It's Sunday. This is today's paper. Sell it to your rich clients for twenty bucks. Give me fifteen. You take five, and we're all winners. <laughs> we were winners. We sold it, we flew him to Paris. How Paris was chosen as the hub and spoke like Memphis, it was the latest flight out of Kennedy in 1993. Air France 009 flew to Paris at 10 o'clock Saturday night, found a way to get newspapers. It's a whole nother story of the persistence needed to get thousands of newspapers. It was easy to do when we had 20, but when it grew into the thousands, it was much harder. We had to get them straight from the New York Times printing press. And believe me, there's unions involved, there's death, there's, there's weird stuff. Weird stuff, I'll have to come back and do Philly again. But there's some weird stuff. When you are selling newspapers in Europe, there's some weird. There was a knock on my New York office door and it was the, what are they called in London? The FBI of London. Am I, am something. That's the movie. Um, the guys from Downing Street. No, inter, not Interpol, there was something else. I made. Scotland Yard, thank you. Scotland Yard showed up because my partner in London had been murdered. And the assumption was that it was murdered because we were undercutting and we were selling so many newspapers that a union shop was being run out by me and this one guy. His name was Martin and Martin got murdered. So I, was, I had to get a lawyer because I was questioned because when they went to Martin's office after he had been murdered, my name was directly on his desk. Like, oh yeah, I'm a real candidate for that. <clears throat> I was like 5'5", five, five, still 130 pounds. Yeah, that's me. I brutally murdered Martin. <clears throat> that was in 1994. 1995, it's 30 years ago. I was uh, 26 years old, and Scotland Yard was asking whether or not I'd murdered someone. And uh, true story, it was his wife. <clears throat> Lesson to be learned. Don't undercut your wife. Larry is here. I'm closing the show tonight. We have three minutes left. I promise you'd be out at nine and I never miss a deadline. I'm gonna close the show with someone who I've only known electronically. And I don't know if many of you know this, didn't get to that, did get to that. Oh, I want to talk about Boeing. I'll have to do that another day. Yes, we're all gonna take airplanes, but yikes. I just have that written down like yikes. 
no, that's nice of you, but listen, Mike was only courteous enough to give us the venue till nine. Um, Larry, I'd like you to tell the audience, and I'm gonna say it into the microphone, uh, what month this is and what you do to make lives better. So this is Autism Awareness Month. This is Autism Awareness Month. And today is the... Oh, yes. Now you'll be on the show directly. Oh, so introduce yourself, because you're gonna be on the pod. Well, first, thank you, Coca. This is Larry Nannery. I'm an autism awareness advocate. And thank you, David, for just a moment to share. Today, April 2nd, is the International Autism Awareness and Acceptance Day. This month is dedicated to helping those who are neurodiverse, who are autistic, who are shy, who are differently engaged, to be able to have some awareness, to be able to have a little bit of knowledge shared about who they are, how they communicate, if they're a little shy, if the lights bother them a little bit, if they sweats a little bit, whatever your traits are, you are a unique person and being able to interact in this world, if it's at a local coffee shop who knows you so you can sit down, if it's at an airport where you're able to get through TSA to help you, if it's at city winery, if it's anywhere, Thank you. Thank you so much for just a moment there. Thank you. No, I wanted Larry to tell you. I appreciate that. In the 44 seconds we have left, uh, I love, uh, you don't have to just give money to charity. You can give up, you can give your time, you can give money, you can give anything. There are so many people who are less fortunate than we are in so many different ways that you don't even realize, whether it's social anxiety, which so many people have and they don't realize, or whether it's physical disabilities or mental disabilities. It's great that athletes are bringing awareness to some mental health issues. When I was team president, as an example, it was never a factor for me. I never considered it, never cared about it. And that's one thing I for sure would change, is I would recognize that mental wellness is so important for an athlete to do his job. I was absolutely demanding of my players to play every day, regardless of what was going on in his home, because I would work every day, and I look back and that I would change. So I would conclude the way I conclude every show, which is I say it's just business. This is nothing personal. So you can end the actual show with that, but I wanna end this show with something slightly different. Today, it's not been about business. It actually has been totally personal because I've wanted to do this and be in front of the people who have really made the show, the people who listen every day, the people who care, the people who've cared about me with all the crazy things I've done during the course of my life. And I will always, always remember Philly as the first ever live Nothing Personal show. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Coca, Sarah. Thank you, everyone.